In the south of Arizona lies the Sonoran Desert, which stretches from present-day Arizona and California to the Mexican state of Sonora. If you go there today, you'd probably note a barren landscape dominated by saguaro cacti and repressive heat. Not exactly a hot spot for a thriving culture. Yet when European settlers first arrived there, they encountered great ruins of mounds and dilapidated canals full of unique potsherds. At the time, the Ikimel O'odam were still living in small communities farming in the Salton Gila River basins. When these settlers asked who had built these structures, they received the answer, Huhugam O'odam, the finished people. Today we call those ancient builders the Hohokam, and in this episode, we're going to see how they thrived in the harsh Sonoran Desert for over a millennia. To the untrained eye, the Sonoran landscape is hardly where one would expect to find a thriving and sophisticated culture. Most areas receive less than 40 centimeters of rainfall on average, some areas as little as 15. However, what appears to be barren to many can actually be bountiful to the enterprising eyes of those who are willing to eke out a living. They would have understood that the valleys were full of edible plants, small and large game, riverine resources, and latent fertile soil and that the secret to success would have been the savvy management of these resources. The most important resources of the desert were, and still are, the Salton Gila Rivers. They provide a crucial source of surface water before draining into the Colorado River. Indeed, these rivers are what water the great modern-day city of Phoenix, which is the fifth largest city in the United States, and in ancient times, they were the axis of incredible human activity. Before the Hohokam came into being, the Sonoran Desert was populated by archaic peoples who seasonally migrated between different areas of the desert. The catalyst for transforming these archaic peoples into the later cultures of the Southwest was the arrival of maize, beans, and squash from Mexico in about 2000 BCE. Those of you who have seen my maize episode should already be familiar with the transformative power of that humble, over-engineered grass. Maize agriculture didn't take off right away. The archaeological evidence shows us that maize was being farmed in the summer before seasonal farmers would move out to other areas where they could live off of wild food sources. Over time, people began to rely on maize more and more, and this began to curtail those seasonal movements and create sedentary populations. By 1500 BCE, we see the constructions of early irrigation ditches to move water and the construction of pit houses to store maize harvests, accompanied by small house groups. These early dwellings are actually not hard to find, and their remains pop up along favorable stretches of river. What's very interesting is that these small house groups aren't actually found in the modern Phoenix area, which is going to become the beating heart of Hohokam culture later on, but instead in the south, in the Santa Cruz Basin. And perhaps that's where it would have stayed, except that around 200 CE, changes in the Santa Cruz River left the canals high and dry and forced a migration further north to the Salton Gila River basins. But who were these early maize farmers? This has been a source of debate for many decades. In the mid-20th century, it was fashionable to theorize that they were migrants from Mesoamerica, and indeed a few scholars still champion this idea today. After all, maize agriculture came from that area originally, and as we'll see, there was a lot of contact between the Hohokam and Mesoamerica. And you could even debate that the Hohokam were part of a larger Mesoamerican sphere. But that's hardly a smoking gun. Cultural similarities are not proof of ethnic connections. Today, the academic consensus is that the Hohokam had a local origin, because those early sites on the Santa Cruz River provide compelling evidence that Hohokam culture emerged from the people who were already there, and that they gradually shifted from seasonal living to sedentary living with maize agriculture. Regardless of where they came from, by about 450 CE, these new settlements began to coalesce into Hohokam culture. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk about chronology. I know that I usually try to spare you these kind of mundane details and dates, but this is actually pretty useful in understanding the Hohokam and their 1,000-year history, so bear with me. I'm not going to break it down as finely as most literature, because there's a lot of disagreement on when these phases and subphases start and end, and what those phases even are. 
I mean, just check out this dizzying chart. What is important to know, and what is universally agreed on, is that Ho'okam history can be divided into two main periods. The period lasting from 450 to 1150 CE is the pre-classic period. This is usually broken into other phases which we aren't going to get into. After 1150 CE, we'll see a lot of changes that culminate in the classic period, which lasts until the end of Hohokam culture in about 1450 CE. The classic is usually subdivided into the early classic from 1150 to 1300 and the late classic from 1300 to the end of the Hohokam. But let's get back to the beginning of the pre-classic period. This is characterized by the formation of permanent communities and the beginnings of what is indisputably Hohokam culture. We can get a good look at this transformation at the site of Valencia Vieja on the Santa Cruz River. The site was originally a small farming settlement of 5 to 10 households, established around 425 CE. Nothing unusual there, that's pretty typical. However, around 500 CE, the settlement began to grow into a village, thanks to an influx of new people. Why did these people come together? As anyone who lives next to an annoying neighbor or in the confines of an overbearing HOA knows, living close has its drawbacks, especially when you're used to wide open spaces and mobility. There are many explanations, but I think that the most interesting ones to focus on are that more labor was needed to build and maintain the ever-expanding canal network. And second, agriculture is always an investment that you have to protect. Crops as well as your property and water rights have to be guarded from would-be intruders and squatters. By 600 CE, the inhabitants of Valencia Vieja had constructed a large plaza in the center of the village that was flanked by up to eight large structures, most likely elite residences. These plazas are a feature of larger pre-classic Hohokam communities, along with ball courts. Wait, ball courts? Aren't those found in Mesoamerica? I hear some of you asking. Indeed they are but they're also a common feature of Hohokam ritual architecture. Now you can see why some people speculate a Mesoamerican origin for the Hohokam. In fact, the state of Arizona has over 200 documented ball courts, though I should mention that some of them lie outside the Hohokam area. Not all of them are necessarily Hohokam. These are not like the stone-built, eye-shaped ball courts that we're used to seeing in Mesoamerica. They're characterized by a dugout trench, often smoothed and plastered at the bottom with high ridges on either side. These come in a variety of sizes, and they can be as large as 75 meters long and 27 meters wide. At first, these were thought to be reservoirs, but none of these ball courts have any silt or sediment that we'd expect to see in a reservoir. These days, most archaeologists agree that these are ball courts where ball games similar to those of Mesoamerica would have been played. On top of that, they would have functioned as important ritual spaces for the entire community, where public ceremonies could be held for hundreds of spectators and participants. Now, I do want to point out that even the largest Ho'okam communities were never full-blown cities. The largest pre-classic settlement at Snaketown only had a population of about one to 2,000 people. Most communities were probably much smaller, but that doesn't make them any less impressive. In smaller communities which is where most Hohokam would have likely lived at the time, small single-room houses would have been arranged around a courtyard and would have shared a communal oven and trash mitten. These house groups would have likely housed extended families that were related to one another. They also would have varied in size from place to place. These settlements and villages would have dotted the rivers and canals. Groups of settlements that are closely linked together are usually called irrigation communities, and these would have shared common water sources. These usually center around a larger village, usually with a ball court or later with a platform mound that would have acted as the local seat of authority, like a county seat in a modern U.S. county. I should also point out that not all Hohokam lived in irrigation communities and farmed all year long. Other Hohokam groups lived in the desert where they would dry farm and forage. These are sometimes called desert Hohokam as opposed to river Hohokam. Don't think of these as static divisions, but as more of a spectrum, some communities were able to stay completely sedentary, while others still practiced seasonal movements to varying degrees. Despite this variation, they still would have been united by common culture and beliefs. Although political authority of the Hohokam is not well understood, it's pretty clear that there was never a single Hohokam state or authority over the region, because no evidence has been found of powerful rulers or administrative bureaucracies. It seems that by 800 or 900 CE, power would have been held by local leaders or chiefs of irrigation communities. 
They would have coordinated construction and water management, conducted ceremonies, and arbitrated disputes. It's been speculated that the very largest communities, usually at the ends of large canals, may have held greater sway over small communities down the canal lines, but how this manifested is unclear. Councils made up of local leaders from different communities would have likely met to decide issues of water use, labor, and land management. Now, in order to accommodate this growing population, the Ho'okam needed to ensure a stable food supply. To create food, they needed to irrigate the land where dry farming wasn't an option. As I mentioned earlier, small canals had been used in the area for nearly a thousand years, but the Ho'okam took this to a whole new level. Their canal networks are huge. If you measure up the total length of these canals in just the Salt and Gila River basins, they reach an astounding 35 kilometers and irrigated up to 70,000 acres of land. Here's a later map of the Phoenix area drawn in 1929 by Omar Turney. It shows the Hohokam canals that were known at the time. These required incredible amounts of labor and organization. Experts estimate that just to construct a single trunk line of a canal system would have required a million person days of labor. That does not include construction of secondary lines and ongoing maintenance and repairs. They would have also had to construct weirs and head gates to carefully control the flow of water. And don't get the idea that these are tiny canals that you can step right over. These are massive. Some of the main canals are up to 23 meters wide. Keep in mind, these were dug out and constructed with simple tools, without any metal. These canals could transport water beyond the natural floodplains and opened up new land for cultivation. I can't emphasize how staggering an achievement of engineering this is. To put it in perspective, these networks were the largest irrigation networks north of Peru. To put it another way, these small farming communities were coming together to irrigate on a scale that was only being exceeded by sophisticated empires and kingdoms. So what did these canals enable? What was the agricultural scene like? Obviously, maize was the most important crop to the Hohokam. To make maize successful in the desert, it had to be adapted by earlier peoples to withstand the arid conditions. The types of maize that were being grown not just by the Hohokam, but by other neighboring desert cultures were heat and drought resistant and had a shorter growing period to minimize the risk of crop failure. And this is a pattern that's also noted in bean strains grown by the Hohokam. They were adapted to the desert heat and aridity as well. Squash and pumpkin were also cultivated. Agave, tobacco, and cotton were also cultivated for food and other uses. Agave and cotton fibers in particular were important for cloth, ropes, and nets. As reliant as they were on agriculture, the Hohokam never forgot their roots and continued to augment their agricultural produce with wild plants of the desert. In particular, the fruit and flesh of the saguaro, choya, and nopal cacti could be harvested yearly. We actually have written accounts of later O'odam using saguaro wine to celebrate the start of the agricultural cycle, and this may be a holdover of ancient Hohokam practices as well. Besides these, edible seeds and wild beans could be easily forged as well. Meat was not abundant in the Hohokam diet, but small and large games such as rabbit, birds, deer, bighorn sheep, and river fish do appear in the archaeological record. The thing that really impresses me about the Hohokam is that they left few resources untapped. During historic times, the indigenous peoples of the southwest were known to have used more than 250 edible plants. The Hohokam were incredibly well adapted to survival in the desert. With an abundance of food, Hohokam craftsmen and craftswomen began producing beautiful artifacts. Perhaps the most distinct of all Hohokam artifacts is their signature red-on-buff pottery. By the way, buff is just a reference to the brown clay that was used. This was made by taking a brown clay pot that was fired outdoors and painting it with a red iron oxide ochre. These artists painted people, lizards, birds, snakes, and abstract designs, and this became a signature style of the Hohokam. On a side note, you can also see these designs painted in rock art that's believed to date from the Hohokam period. Highly decorated pieces such as these serve domestic and ritual functions, and many artists fashion these into very elaborate forms. Censers would have likely been used for burning incense in rituals. Pottery would have also been used for holding ashes of the cremated dead, which were often buried in the ground with clay figurines of people and animals. 
Now these exotic ceramics were not used by everyone for everything. Everyday use ceramics for cooking and storage would have just been made of plain buffware. I want to emphasize that this pottery is very unique to the Hohokam and very distinct from their Mogollon and Pueblo neighbors. Another important item that can be found is shell jewelry from marine shells that would have come all the way from the Pacific via trade. Most of these shell artifacts would have arrived in Hohokam territory pre-finished. As time went on, Hohokam craftsmen began to work raw shell into finished products. These marine shells would have been fashioned into bracelets, rings, beads, and pendants for people of all ages. Whole conch shells would have also been prized as trumpets for rituals and ceremonies. Evidence of shell crafting is abundant at Hohokam sites, and this shows that it was greatly prized by the Hohokam people. Other goods produced by the Hohokam include stone points, baskets, cotton cloth, carved wood and bone, stone pallets, feather cloaks, and stone carvings. Many of these items are believed to have been made by craft specialists. How these goods were distributed is a matter of debate, and these different proposals are not always exclusive. Some scholars have proposed a market system of exchange where festivals and market days and community plazas spurred bartering for various goods. Unfortunately, no markets or warehouses have been found in the archaeological record, so that's a bit speculative. Others have proposed that, like many other pre-industrial societies, finished goods would have been distributed by gift-giving, gambling, marriage dowries, and ritual offerings. What is pretty clear, though, is that these goods would have been an important badge of identity that would have distinguished the Hohokam from their southwestern neighbors. And speaking of neighbors, let's take a look at the interaction the Hohokam had with the people around them. Another impressive legacy of the Hohokam was their huge trade network. As I mentioned earlier when we discussed the ball courts, they had a strong connection with Mesoamerica, and several Mesoamerican goods found their way into the southwest. Now when I say Mesoamerica, I'm not talking about the familiar regions like the Valley of Mexico, Oaxaca, or the Maya region, but instead of West Mexico along the Pacific coast. You know, that part of Mesoamerica that typically gets left unlabeled on maps. West Mexico has its own fascinating history and relationship with Central Mexico that we'll explore someday in exquisite detail, but for now, we're just going to look at its place in the Hohokam trade network. Goods from this area moved up the Pacific coast, through the desert, and into the American Southwest. Remember, many of these people would have spoken Udo-Aztecan languages, so it's likely that there was a linguistic continuum between these far-flung peoples that would have facilitated the exchange of goods. What goods, you may be asking? The most impressive are the hundreds of copper bells from the metalsmiths of Michoacan that have been found at Hohokam sites. Small amounts of Mesoamerican pottery and Mesoamerican-inspired pottery can sometimes be found as well. Many examples show a four-part bilateral symmetry that's similar to designs in West Mexico. In rare cases, they're even painted with Mesoamerican iconography. Iron pyrite mirrors have also been found, which themselves are likely a West Mexican version of the pyrite and obsidian mirrors found in central Mexico. On top of that, macaw remains have been found which would have been used as a source of beautiful and exotic feathers. These macaws would have come from southern Mexico, although we also know that macaws were being bred at the site of Casas Grandes in northern Chihuahua, so it's certainly possible that they were supplying them to the Hohokam. Another exotic good that was coming from Mexico was chocolate, trace amounts of which have been detected in Hohokam pots. The Pacific coast provided Hohokam with marine shell that were used for crafting, as we saw earlier. Now trade didn't just face south. The Hohokam also traded with the Pueblo cultures to the north. In exchange for marine shell and cotton, the Hohokam were able to get turquoise and jet. Those ties to the northern cultures are going to be important down the road, so keep that in mind. I hope all this has impressed upon you how adept the Hohokam were at acquiring foreign goods from different neighbors. At its height, Hohokam trading networks stretched from Chaco Canyon all the way to the edges of Mesoamerica. What can all this tell us about Hohokam beliefs and cosmology? Our best evidence comes from their mortuary practices. Pre-classic Hohokam didn't typically bury their dead, preferring cremation instead, at least in the core Hohokam area. These cremation remains often contain incense burners and ceramic figurines. As I mentioned earlier, their pottery often includes iconography such as birds, snakes, and lizards, but it's uncertain if these represent deities or supernatural beings. 
These objects have been interpreted on one hand as elements of ancestor worship or of an agricultural fertility cult. Some people stress the similarities between this paraphernalia and art and those of Mesoamerican spiritual practices. The stone palettes that we saw earlier were likely used to snuff hallucinogens, which brings to mind the shamanic rituals of Mesoamerica. Architecture can also cue us into aspects of Hohokam religion. In the very early days, plazas were likely public ritual spaces that were replaced in later times by ball courts at the larger sites. The ball courts would have been the sites of ball games, which would have held special religious significance. Such games were part of larger community events with feasting, dancing, and other rituals. Even later O'odam were still playing a version of the ball game in historic times. Now, the picture I've just painted for you of small irrigation communities dotting the river and canals, building ball courts, and trading with Mesoamerica is the picture of the Hohokam pre-classic period. And that's about to come to an abrupt end. Around 1150 CE, at the start of the classic period, there was a radical shift in Hohokam culture. An important catalyst of this change was an environmental catastrophe, one that affected not just the Hohokam, but the entire Southwest. We know from tree ring data that the pre-classic had actually been a pretty wet period, well, by southwestern standards at any rate. By the beginning of the 12th century, rainfall had become less consistent and began to fluctuate wildly. As if this wasn't worrying enough, between 1020 and 1160, the Gila River began to cut down and widen, which would have rendered many of those Hohokam Canal headgates useless and would have triggered a rebuilding of canals and a loss of irrigable land. But the Hohokam were a stubborn and persistent group. They didn't just take this adversity lying down. Instead, they adapted. During these trying times, Hohokam settlements began to consolidate and reorganize into new settlement patterns. A good example of this reorganization can be seen near the pre-classic site of Snaketown. Snaketown was the largest pre-classic community in the Hohokam area, but it was abandoned shortly after the pre-classic period. In the immediate vicinity of the site, there were seven ball court communities, but by the end of the classic period, these settlements had consolidated into three larger irrigation communities, nearly doubling the amount of irrigable land between them. This also had the consequence of concentrating Hohokam population into the heart of the Salt and Gila River basins near modern-day Phoenix. Another way that this change was manifest was in the village architecture. People stopped building open villages with plazas and ball courts, and instead began to erect walled compounds on elevated platform mounds. By the late classic, these mounds would have been topped with great houses and towers built of adobe, and would have been surrounded by walls, effectively separating them from the rest of the community. If Snaketown is the poster boy of pre-classic settlement, then Casa Grande, with its still-standing big house, is the archetypal settlement of the classic period. Just a word of warning, don't confuse this with the contemporary site of Casas Grandes in North Chihuahua that we mentioned earlier. As you can see, this is an impressive structure, and unlike anything we've seen before. Most scholars assume that this change in architecture came with a change in the social order. Those walled compounds and elite residences are unmistakably exclusive symbols of power by local elites. It shouldn't come as a big surprise, then, that burials from these complexes show increased social stratification. But architecture and village life wasn't the only thing that changed. There were changes to the culture as well. Much of the ritual paraphernalia that we saw earlier disappears completely. Those pallets, stone bowls, ceramic figurines, and censers, and presumably their associated ceremonies that we saw in the pre-classic Hohokam culture, are gone. The old animal iconography of lizards, snakes, and birds gets replaced by toads and raptors. Not the dinosaurs, the birds. This is usually seen as a sign of religious and ideological shift. Another notable change is that cremation becomes rarer, and instead elites begin burying their dead with grave goods in elite cemeteries. This evidence is typically interpreted as the abandonment of domestic ancestor worship that characterized pre-classic Hohokam religion. From what we can tell of all these changes, the Hohokam began to participate in a larger southwestern cult. Many speculate that this change in religion had something to do with the environmental stress that the Hohokam were experiencing after the 11th century. In this new order, elites played an important role in conducting private rituals with other elites. 
However, public rituals still would have been possible from the tops of those structures on the platform mounds, so this cult would have likely had a public dimension to it, albeit a very controlled one. These changes also coincide with a weakening of Mesoamerican contact and influence, and an increase in contact with the Pueblo people to the north. In fact, many ancestral Pueblo migrated from the Cayenta region of northern Arizona and made their way into former Hohokam lands. Archaeologists can detect this influx by analyzing the pottery of the sites that date to that time. Ancestral Pueblo made their pottery by coiling as opposed to the Hohokam who used a hammer and anvil method, but the more obvious difference is aesthetic. These immigrants usually produced salado polychromes with distinctive iconography, and this style began to dominate Hohokam sites. Buffwares were still being produced, but not to the same extent that they were in the pre-classic. This immigration picked up steam as time went by, and by the 14th century, entire communities of purely Pueblo inhabitants were being founded on the Hohokam periphery. Unfortunately, the classic fluorescence was short-lived. The Hohokam had certainly displayed their ability to adapt to changing conditions, but finally the culture gave way. By 1450, Hohokam culture had disappeared. What eventually pushed the Hohokam to the brink is not certain. Invasion, disease, soil degradation, and field salinization have all been proposed at one time or another. The current theory enjoying the limelight is that flooding in the 14th century had a catastrophic effect on the canal infrastructure, from which the communities never recovered, forcing the populations to settle elsewhere. Others have pointed out that increasingly hierarchical and demanding leadership may have been overthrown as it became clear that they were unable to solve the crisis. Interestingly, the most likely descendants of the Hohokam, the Akimel O'odam, do preserve stories in their oral traditions that may offer some clues. According to these traditions, the god Earth Medicine Man created the gods and the O'odam speaking people. However, there is a great flood which causes the gods and several of the O'odam speakers to flee to the underworld. While in the underworld, the proud god Elder Brother returns to the surface and creates a new group of O'odam speakers, the Finished Ones. Eventually, however, the Finished Ones turn against Elder Brother and kill him, but he comes back to life, goes to the underworld, and convinces the O'odam there to journey to the surface and to make war on the very people he created. Eventually, they succeed at conquering the Finished Ones, and from there, the rest of the creation narrative proceeds. These accounts of floods and warfare may recall ancient events in the deep past of the O'odam that could shed light on the fate of the Hohokam, now, I should emphasize that there are other oral traditions from other groups in the area, like the Yavapai and the Maricopa, that differ a lot from this telling, and that these storytellers are not recounting a history of memory, but a story of the deep mythological past. Whatever the reasons for the collapse, Hohokam culture had ceased to exist. Former Hohokam territory remained sparsely populated until the arrival of Europeans. If there were still large populations afterwards, it's very likely that old world diseases took their toll. Never again did an indigenous culture of the Hohokam's likeness grace the river valleys of Arizona. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that all the Hohokam people died off. They stuck around, but in a new way. Today, their descendants, the O'odam, the Maricopa, the Yavapai, are still there and still honoring their ancestors. Nothing sums up this connection better than these words from O'odam storyteller and educator Daniel Lopez that I found moving. The earth gives us a sense of connection to the people of the past. That is why we say that the earth is holy and should not be disturbed, because the land belongs to the spirits. Even in the mountains, we can feel the power of the Huhugam spirits as we journey to the mountain villages. As we breathe the holy air that gives us life, we can feel the power of our ancestors. When we see the stars at night and hear the owl, some of us feel strongly that we are part of the ancient past. But the Hohokam legacy doesn't end there. In fact, the Hohokam legacy continues to play an important role in the Phoenix area today. When settlers began constructing the modern city of Phoenix, they repaired a lot of those ancient canals to bring water into the city and to the surrounding area. If you live in the Phoenix area and you've got running water, you owe some thanks to those resilient ancient people of the desert. Most of those ancient canals are below the city today, but if you ventured to Mesa, Arizona, 
you can visit the Park of the Canals, which still preserves an ancient Hohokam Canal that was repaired and used by Mormon settlers in the 1800s. That ancient canal network even garnered the award for excellence in prehistoric engineering from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Not a bad reputation at all. The Hohokam should always remind us of the great challenges that simple communities can overcome when they cooperate and work together. They transformed the desert into fertile valleys by constructing one of the most impressive water management systems ever engineered by ancient people. While doing all that, they created a vibrant culture that endured for a thousand years. The Hohokam did not simply exist. They did not simply live. They triumphed. That's going to wrap us up for today. Special thanks to my patrons listed right here. You guys are the best. If you'd like to join these fine individuals and support the channel, you can do so on Patreon. The link will be in the video description. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on Facebook. Until next time, take care, and we'll see you in our next episode.